title of my presentation this afternoon is Transforming Higher Education with Blended Learning, Managing Expectations and Bridging Gaps. And uh, I'm very much hoping that I can empower you in some ways, but I'm also looking forward to hearing from you all about perhaps your experiences with blended learning, um, because as I know, the European Association for Distance Teaching Universities shares a wealth of knowledge in this field, and the University of Graz considers itself as an on-campus university, a so-called brick and mortar university. So um, in many ways, we have a lot of catching up to do. We face some different challenges than perhaps um, distance teaching universities, uh, but we're up for the challenge and I'd like to report about a project in the Department of Catholic Theology. Uh, but before that, I would like to give you a little bit of context of the University of Graz uh, and an image to go with it. We're in the center of Europe, uh, the northeast of Austria. Uh, our university was founded in 1585 and it's now Austria's second oldest and also second largest uh, higher education institution. Uh, we have about 32,500 students, uh, and like I said before, we're an on-campus university, and I think our management very much wants to continue on that path. Um, but of course, we are living in a you know digitized world. We are facing new challenges in the digital age, and so we'd like to keep up with that. Uh, we have an e-learning strategy uh, at our institution that employs a pedagogy first approach uh, and we support technology enhanced learning in different ways. Um, I myself am an educational uh, design and instructional design specialist at the Center for Digital Teaching and Learning and uh, I uh, work together, we are a small team of seven people, um, but uh, we work sort of on the side of advising faculty members to implement new technologies in uh, their classrooms, but we also have a separate IT department that's responsible for the um, sort of managing the technology aspect of it. We use Moodle as our central VLE. Uh, we've used it since uh, 2012. Uh, we have approximately uh, 12,000 courses uh, on Moodle at this point, but um, only a smaller amount of those courses uses the VLE for what, um, generally speaking, is more than just um, a repository of resources. So you already understand the challenge of that. Um, we do have, um, just uh, mentioning on the side, together with the uh, Technology University of Graz, uh, a MOOC platform, if anybody is interested, it, we call it iMOOCs, uh, so iMOOCs.at, that um, basically really operates uh, with the thought of open educational resources in mind and offers MOOCs for everyone trying to also fulfill our third mission. So we do, uh, on the one hand, host the platform together with Graz University of Technology and we also provide content for it. That's a little bit of context for you uh, for what I'd like to do today, which is talk specifically about a project at the Catholic uh, faculty, the Faculty of Catholic Theology. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to follow a uh, basic outline. Uh, I'd like to describe the project for you first. Uh, I will also talk about how we evaluated this blended learning project um, is an ongoing and continuous evaluation and how we then came to analyze the data from this evaluation. And then I'd like to share a few preliminary outcomes and lessons learned with you, as well as then give you a little bit of an outlook and open questions um, that we have at the end. Um, at this point, I'd also like to invite you to maybe share in the chat whether or not there's other uh, participants in this webinar who are currently housed at a traditional on-campus university uh, or where you are. I, I'd love to hear that uh, and maybe any experiences that you have if you are in a similar situation of being in an on-campus university. So uh, let me start with giving you a little bit of an overview on the project as such. Uh, this is a blended learning bachelor program that was introduced at the University of Graz. It's the university's first blended learning bachelor program. 
and we uh, established it after uh, a planning phase in the winter semester of 2017. Uh, so it's been running for a year now and so today I can share with you some first year in review insights uh, but I hope you understand this project is very much in the making. Uh, we're adding new courses every semester that we're changing from a traditional face-to-face -face format to a blended learning format and uh, and we're of course continuing our evaluation and continuing to uh, tweak the implementations we've made, continuing to update our uh, instructional pedagogical design for the classes. Uh, in terms of a target group for this bachelor program, uh, I also would like to give a little bit of context here. Uh, we do target non-traditional adult learners and part-time students. Uh, in German-speaking countries, understanding that, of course, because there are some face-to-face -face sessions uh, where students have to come to campus, the predominant number of students are from Austria, from any of its nine states, or from uh, you know the you know the the closer border regions bordering um, Germany. But uh, the idea of this blended learning bachelor is or was on behalf of the Faculty of Catholic Technology, Catholic, excuse me, theology, that uh, they would try to diversify their student population, try to enlarge their student population, uh, and simply attract a new demographic. So that's why this was conceived. It was very much a top-down process uh, at the management level of the faculty. Uh, and uh, and it, that, of course, comes with its own sort of challenges and restrictions, I would say, because there's also some uh, uh, work that has to be done at the level of the individual faculty members to convince them for why this is the new way to go or a path to um, go along on. So the model is really blended learning uh, in the sense that we use as our central VLE Moodle. So all of the classes have a corresponding Moodle course. Most of the classes, even though not all, that depends on the class type, have face-to-face uh, -face sessions that are blocked on three to four days a semester. Uh, and that is typically a Friday, so it allows students that are working students to come to campus and to have one day of an intense experience where they are learning with their group of peers and um, are doing this three to four days a semester. In terms of study design and data analysis, uh, I'd like to uh, give you insight into how we set this up. We were very much aware of the fact that mm, such a big project that is new to uh, all of the stakeholders involved needs ongoing evaluation. So we've been doing this with all the stakeholders, with the students that are uh, you know, one major group that's important, but just as important in our opinion is the faculty members, the teachers, um, as well as members of the management on the level of the um, of the uh, faculty. So what we did was we had students fill out online questionnaires two times a semester. Uh, we also supplemented this quantitative uh, survey data with interviews in-depth group interviews that we conducted with the students and uh, in-depth interviews that we conducted with selected faculty members. I should say that when the program was introduced, the uh, number of enrolled students was roughly uh, at 40, which was exceeding all expectations uh, because it's the smallest faculty at our university so they were very happy to have that many students of those 40 however not everybody showed up on the first day uh, and they might have different reasons for why they enrolled in this program in the first place but didn't show there's no way really for us to um, know why that is the case uh, and we've faced in the first year a dropout quote of roughly one-third of the students uh, and that is also in line with other research when it comes to blended learning programs that's not necessarily higher or lower but uh, it uh, oh my presentation I guess 
switched. Let me go back to this. Um, but I just wanted to give you that in terms of context because student dropout and retention, of course, is something that we're taking seriously and we're looking at. Uh, but we also have to be realistic when implementing a blended learning program. There's always going to be dropout. So um, the way we analyzed our data then was with qualitative content analysis, and uh, that led us to a number of conclusions that I'm happy to share with you. Um, Callie is asking a question in the chat right now, whether the change to blended learning was principally a way to increase enrollment. Uh, that's a good observation. The pragmatic answer would be yes. Uh, but of course, the uh, faculty as such also really wanted to um, experiment with new ways of teaching and there's a number of very motivated instructors and teachers and professors there but yes uh, of course that was the desired side effect um, the bachelor program after a reform was introduced and in that first year where it was still on campus teaching uh, they had very low enrollment so they were hoping um, to increase it by making it possible for working students to attend the other um, motivation for it is is also pragmatic in that sense in that they um, have talked to stakeholders within certain institutions of the Catholic Church and other uh, nonprofit organizations where they would think there's potential interest among people to study such a program and they found out that the interest was in fact there and that they um, should uh, try to cater to this demographic by offering something that can be studied part-time and largely remotely. So I hope that answers your question. Thanks for that. If other people have questions as I go along, by all means, please pose them in the chat. Uh, I'd like to share with you next uh, from the many sound bites that we received from our survey participants, from our study participants, from the students as well as the teachers, uh, some statements that by no means represent all the statements that were made, but I think they show the heterogeneous groups, both on behalf of the students and on behalf of the faculty. So I'd like to start with some faculty perspectives here. Teachers reported as follows. It was fun to enter a new field with other people, getting some input yourself, but having it expanded by others. Here they were talking about, for example, Moodle and the possibilities it offers for collaboration and uh, communication online and making sure this is very much a shared learning space. Somebody else said everyone was kind of doing their own thing and one didn't really know what works for others and what doesn't work. I would wish for more collaboration. This was a perspective from a professor who was hoping that the teachers themselves would get together more and share their experiences. What for many was a new experience teaching with a VLE to that extent. Uh, Somebody else said, students have a very strong sense of themselves as customers, much stronger than full-time students. Student behavior was very much like this. We have enrolled in this program. You told us it is compatible with work. Now you have to give us this. Now you have to deliver, so to speak. Um, that shows that there are, of course, uh, some differing expectations on behalf of the students versus what the faculty members think they can do. Uh, and this attitude, some may call it a sense of entitlement on behalf of the students was perceived as something negative. Uh, and then somebody else raised concerns with regards to whether or not they could be doing this in this new format. I wasn't sure how this would work. If I could do it, how much work it would be. So you see it's a diverging uh, set of comments. And that, of course, speaks to the fact that there's individuals that are involved in this program. And it speaks to the challenges that uh, one encounters because you want to make sure that the driving stakeholders feel that their concerns are taken seriously. At the same time, it's difficult to please everyone in that setting. Same with the students. Uh, some very positive and some not so positive um, comments. For example, there's a bit of an addiction with Moodle. I, I like this comment because that student talked about how 
in order to feel connected to the cohort and to the teachers and to the program and the institution, they would log on on a regular basis just to see what's new. And uh, that was exciting for them. And so they really liked that experience of staying connected through the VLE. Somebody else said, the study program is interesting, but next to my job, I cannot attend all lectures and seminars because the amount of work is tremendous and time consuming for me. That was one of our major uh findings which i'm going to speak to uh in a minute but the work-life balance is something that the students uh really struggled with and i think was also something that there was a bit of a disconnect with regards to what the program intends to do what the students think they should be doing and what in reality they can actually do then somebody else said it took a while to get the hang of it uh, they were speaking here both about the technology, about using Moodle for the first time, as well as about, you know, just studying. Uh, remember, this is a bachelor program. So what that means is that uh, students do not have, in most cases, a prior degree. They come to the university as first time students in many cases. And they come to the university after having been out of, so to, so to speak, a formal school or education system for a while. Our average age for the students that enrolled, which was anticipated, is uh, you know about 40 years old. So you see that they're not high school graduates, recent high school graduates, who may have uh, encountered learning management systems in one way or another, or who may still sort of be familiar with uh, modes of teaching and learning, specifically with technology. So the students quickly found out that, you know, it may be the technology as such, once they've mastered that, wasn't so intimidating, but the number of classes that they enrolled for uh, and the workload that comes with that was. And so for many, the realization also came that they in fact are at a university and that's a full-fledged program. One quote that I don't have on this slide but I thought was very insightful was um, of a female student who talked about this study program with her grown daughters who themselves are studying at this point. And the daughters looked at the number of credits and looked at what the mother had enrolled and asked her how she was going to do this. And the mother then realized that maybe the workload that she thought she had to do in one semester wasn't going to work out. Uh, final quote on this slide, uh, some students do critique the fact that not every teacher seems as motivated as the next. So that, of course, is something that also drives then motivation on behalf of the students because again there's a difference on whether or not uh, content is merely just provided as a repository in Moodle as a repository or whether or not there's really an active awareness on behalf of the teachers that they have to now fulfill different roles whether it be the one of the e-moderator or something else right so uh, we, of course, at the Center for Digital Teaching and Learning, have been doing ongoing staff development, ongoing training sessions, and one-on-one -on -one, uh, guidance and you know, facilitation. But, of course, it doesn't always happen that way that these things then get implemented. I think, generally speaking, we, of course, all know about the challenges of blended learning on different levels. Pedagogical level would uh, of course, include the key challenges that come with incorporating flexibility, facilitating interaction, facilitating students' learning process, and fostering effective climate. I'm borrowing here from a list uh, that was created by Bill and Stavever and Wirt in terms of key challenges. Um, the technological level, then, of course, is uh, due to the fact that Online phases during blended learning require the use of web-based technologies. And when the VLE is the first choice, uh, we need to remember that pedagogy should drive technology and not the other way around. Uh, again, then we need to ensure if we implement uh, such a program that both the faculty and the teachers uh, can manage the VLE properly both pedagogically and technologically. And if these skills are not developed enough, then it's necessary to provide appropriate training and support. Uh, one aspect that was challenging also for us in this context was that uh, for the blended learning bachelor, we produced videos 
some of them were uh, produced as open educational resources. Most of them were uh, implemented on Moodle, simply linked on Moodle. Uh, but these learning videos were produced in a studio with the instructors. And so when doing that, at least in Central Europe, we face several challenges, uh, struggling with copyright issues on the one hand, but also, of course, increasing the workload of the professors and shifting the workload from the regular semester to the semester breaks. The videos had to be recorded in the studio over the summer or over the winter break. Uh, and that also does something to the way that instructors, teachers have to be available throughout the year. And then that additional workload isn't always, uh, isn't always um, honored with money or other resources. So that's just an add on that the faculty was um, sort of concerned with. The third level, of course, is the institutional level. And, if, and even though uh, blended learning has a lot of rather long tradition, it's still not adopted by traditional higher education institutions to its full extent. And oftentimes, it comes down again to resources, uh, financial and otherwise, that makes it difficult to implement uh, the ideas that have been conceived on paper. But moving from the general challenges of blended learning to our major outcomes, I'd like to talk about the lessons learned that we have, that the lessons that we have learned after one year. And uh, we essentially came up with an interconnected framework that in part is grounded in Khan's e-learning framework and Oscon's and Kozler's uh, hexagonal e-learning assessment model, uh, but we found sort of different names for uh, the important aspects in here, and those are the roles of students, the roles of faculty members, pedagogical aspects, technological aspects, and institutional aspects. And rather than just giving solutions to very complex questions in many cases, we decided uh, that we would provide some guiding questions. And the guiding questions are what I'd like to introduce to you in the next few minutes uh, before then I'll have a closer look at the chat because uh, I see that there are some more questions. When it comes to students, the questions that have resulted from studying our survey and interview material are the following, and this is only an excerpt, um, so I'm really interested in hearing if you have others that you would like to add to this. How do the students see themselves and their roles as students? What expectations do they have towards the program management and the faculty members? I was talking earlier about this sense of being a customer uh, versus uh, the faculty members perhaps having uh, different expectations of the students that might not be fulfilled. How can expectations of students and instructors or the program management be brought together? What needs to be done if they don't align? Those are all questions that we need to ask ideally as we're implementing such programs in our opinion, uh, but it's not always easy of course to find answers. How can students be supported to exchange experiences, to reflect on the organization of their studies, and to learn from each other? Uh, based on our interview data, we noted that students weren't as well connected uh, via social media as we would hope for. So we uh, instituted or in included uh, a Moodle course that was available for all the students of the cohort that was serving as some kind of platform, communication platform for them where they could exchange their questions and ask for help and advice. Then again, we noted that they weren't using that as much either. So this semester we're trying to have a monthly chat, an online meeting space with a study assistant who's able to meet the students on the same level and who's able to um, communicate with them and try to see what questions they have. But that's also something that we didn't anticipate because we thought for sure they would find informal networks to uh, exchange their ideas and questions. And then that ties in with the sense of student community 
because of course students who've never been at a university or institution of higher education they lack the networks they lack also certain skills that would come with being on campus on a day-to-day -day basis and because these are working students it's very hard to make sure they get all the information they need and they feel part of a larger something. So again, uh, next week actually will be a face-to-face -face cafe where students before their classes start are invited in an informal space to meet some of the professors, to meet the study assistant one more time, to ask these questions in person so that it's not just everything is online. The faculty members, uh, as another major stakeholder, of course, also uh, something important to consider when uh, implementing a blended learning program. And in our experience, these are the questions, the guiding questions that we came up with. How can instructors be motivated to participate in a blended learning program, especially if there's no monetary reward behind it because that's just not part of their contract yet? What hinders motivation and engagement? How can the program management on the one hand and the administrative staff familiar with the technology enhanced learning assist instructors in understanding their changing role as teachers? I mentioned before that e-moderation was an important aspect that we tried to uh, train faculty members in this regard and make them aware of the fact that e-moderation requires specific skills, different skills than are required when you teach face-to-face, -face, but uh, that's a process. And if you've been teaching for 20 years, that process might just be a longer one for you, for you to be able to um, teach in this different setting. How can faculty members find out more about their group of students? That would also, again, uh, help to bridge the gap between expectations uh, and students' ideas of, of what it is that they're expected to do. How can teacher-student relationships be built with only minimal face-to-face -face time? And how can prejudices regarding blended learning be countered? Whose responsibility is it to do this? Some faculty members indeed thought that because they're required to teach online now, the quality of teaching uh, wouldn't be as high or the workload couldn't be as high as in their face-to-face -face classes. And though these are, of course, wrong assumptions, it requires uh, sort of uh, a very sensitive approach to counter these um, notions and to make sure everybody is on the same page. Moving on to pedagogical aspects and the guiding questions we have there, we encountered the following. Um, we experimented with providing all the course content at the beginning of the semester immediately visible and accessible through the VLE. And we also experimented with um, making content available according to a set schedule, bi-weekly, um, et cetera. There is, of course, no answer to how this should be done or what the preferred mode of something like that would be, but it is a question that needs to be asked at the individual level of each faculty member. Same goes for assignment deadlines. Should they be set during or right after holidays and semester breaks, or should there be designated free times, recognizing that part-time students struggle to maintain a good life-work balance uh, based on their life circumstances? Uh, again, in our interview data, we received mixed results for that, and there was one group that preferred to have these free times and was talking about how important it is, whereas other groups wanted to have more flexibility and appreciated the fact that they could um, study and work during lecture-free times. The same goes for exams. When should those be held? If you're asking students to come to campus, should uh, exams be held in just one day to minimize the time and effort to come to campus, or should exam dates be spread out to avoid work and study overload? And finally, some technological aspects. What kind of support do faculty members and students need to cope with technological aspects and challenges of blended learning? That's, of course, difficult to identify. How can media and computer literacy be developed in light of scarce time resources? How can faculty members and students be assisted in coping with changing technologies? And how can the program management and other stakeholders 
offer incentives for faculty members to engage with technology themselves rather than delegating these tasks to administrative assistants. Because that's something that students do notice. Um, if it's the administrative assistant that's uploading the material that's active in the online discussion board uh, versus whether or not this is actually the instructor themselves. In many ways, uh, we found out that implementing the blended learning bachelor at the Faculty of Catholic Theology is very much a project about managing expectations, the teacher's needs versus the student's needs, the work-life balance versus the changing roles, and also managing expectations with regards to ideal versus reality. There's lots of studies out there uh, with regards to how blended learning would work in practice, but at the end of the day, each institution is somewhat different and we can only learn from our specific circumstances and learn from the feedback that we got from our stakeholders and try to redesign following the ADDI model, for example, uh, when it comes to instructional design as just one, one example. The other, uh, going back to my headline, other than managing expectations, the other essential part is to bridge gaps. And that is only possible if you communicate clearly with all the stakeholders. If you try to alleviate fears, that's certainly part of our job at the Center for Digital Teaching and Learning, especially when it comes to use of new technology and new roles um, of teaching. If you develop skills in the form of ongoing training, if you foster engagement so that the students feel that there's more to a VLE than just material, videos, or PDFs, or PowerPoints online, but their active contribution is sought after and is desired and is also um, reciprocated by the faculty members. And of course, that goes in line with providing support, continuous and ongoing, and to not see this as a finished project, but something that's ongoing. Looking at the time, I'm going to jump to the conclusions here. For us, the conclusions were that blended learning offers great potentials, also for brick and mortar higher educational institutions. However, the challenges are quite significant, and that's something that we're grappling with, and I'm curious to see uh, where you are grappling with similar issues, perhaps. Um, the frequent and ongoing evaluation of design and implementation is necessary. We're going to continue this with more surveys, with more uh, interviews, and try to also compare, because now the second cohort, so to speak, has already started studying, even though at a university we don't really have cohorts. That's also a bit of a drawback in order to create community. Faculty support needs to be ongoing and needs to continue. And the information exchange between groups is key and very vital um, for this whole project to really work out. Part-time students really, in many ways, need more support in their learning processes, particularly during online phases. Uh, and student motivation is higher when faculty members engage in different forms of e-teaching. And uh, as the program continues at our university, we know that our focus should remain on student satisfaction and engagement, particularly to address the issue of retention, but also take into consideration instructors' needs for continuing support when it comes to redesigning their courses and setting up their VLEs. And with that, I'd like to open the floor, so to speak, the chat, for questions, and I'm going to look at questions that um, are already in the chat. Uh, so thank you for your attention, and I'm going to try and answer the questions that um, we have already. Over to you, Dario. So uh, thanks a lot, Simone, for your interesting presentation. It's time for questions. I think there are already some questions in chat. Yes, I'm going to try and see. Um, 
Vasco Silva is asking, was there any comment from the survey that led to changes in the course and course method? Uh, yes, uh, very much so. Uh, because the students in the survey and interview uh, interviews, they talked about the fact that uh, some faculty members seemed more engaged than others. Uh, what we did throughout the semester was to uh, make sure that the one-on-one -on -one consultations uh, were kept going and uh, we sent out some material that would ensure instructors were aware of their role as e-moderators, what that entails. Um, and we tried to uh, gently remind them of the fact that, for instance, if uh, they teach a lecture, but the uh, participation in that sense, the way the Austrian system is set up is not mandatory. However, they want some interaction on Moodle that they need to show the proper incentives. They need to maybe start a, um, uh, a, a, a thread in the forum and pose a few questions on the reading material and try to draw in their students. Um, and, and so we did little things here and there, um, but we also on the larger scale experimented with um, a format where this semester based on the student evaluations who very much appreciate the short uh, learning videos uh, that are more time consuming to produce and post-production in the studio uh, outside the studio um, take some more time we developed two courses that now follow a model where it's a mixture of the learning videos and a few face-to-face um, sessions that are also being recorded and the VLE um, for communication and collaboration. Um, and so that really helps the students to get the main information in the learning videos, uh, but also then on these very few dates that they can come to campus, have the interaction with the teacher, something the teacher also wanted and very much appreciated. And so those are um, things that we have tweaked here and there um, based on the feedback. We have made a few adjustments with regards to the te technological aspects on Moodle uh, and how, you know, looking at the design of um, the VLE and, and all that came as a result of the student um, evaluations. Yes. Um, let me see what other questions are here. Jose uh, has the question, what is the pedagogical model? Briefly, what goes online and what stays face to face? What about student assessment? Um, there's two types of classes. Uh, so far, uh, the ones that require continuous assessment and what we call lecture courses. Lecture courses have the advantage or disadvantage, depending on what side you're on, of just one final exam at the end of the semester. Uh, there's more than one date. Students can choose which date they go and sit the exam. It's an uh, exam that they have to come to campus for. Uh, and essentially, it's up to the teacher to design the semester in a way that content is made available, uh, that some interaction takes place. But again, that's, like I said, only voluntary. And, uh, and then the other type of class is pro seminars or seminars where there's continuous assessment. And so there uh, we can use the activities on Moodle, whether or not it's grading discussion posts, ref writing reflection papers, or um, you know, uh, doing self-assessment or also quizzes online. Um, and so it really depends on the course type and uh, when you say what goes online and what stays to face face to face, uh, I think what a lot of the teachers have adopted is a model that kind of uh, follows a flipped classroom approach, I would say, in the sense that they provide some content material on Moodle, whether it be in the form of videos or in the form of um, uh, of text and then they use the face-to-face -face sessions for in-depth discussions they use it for reflections for questions uh, and so on and so forth so that's in many ways the model behind that there is a publication uh, of this project and it's going to come out in the uh, proceedings 
of the uh, latest conference organized by the EADTU. Uh, it's going to be in the conference proceedings. I published an article um, together with Michael Kopp and Lisa Scher on this topic and um, maybe Lizzie knows more about when the publication will be online. So thanks for that and for your interest. I don't know if I saw all the questions here. I think I did. And I also don't want to take too much of the time because I think yeah. we're a little over time. I now. have just like one more question. Things. Yes. Yes. I have just one more question. Um, of course, the pedagogical model um, depends by the number of quantity of activities that you do in presence at a distance. In your case, you are just uh, three, four days of activity in presence. So my question is, is the activity in presence according to you mandatory or not? Because if you answer uh, no, it becomes a course that can be fully at distance. But if you answer yes, it's a course, you put uh, very small constraints to courses uh, for students that uh, will study in a more flexible way. Yes. Um, so that again, thanks for that question, Dario. If I understood correctly, you're asking whether or not um, presence in these face-to-face -face sessions is mandatory or not. Mm -hmm. um, it depends on the course type. So we are restricted in many ways by the course types that um, we have available. So again, something like a lecture, you cannot make attendance mandatory even in those face-to-face -face sessions. So students, for whatever reason they choose to um, stay home, that's their prerogative and, uh, and there's no consequence for that. Um, the uh, continuous assessment classes such as pro seminars and seminars, they do have attendance, uh, but of course there's always days that you can miss, so there's a grace uh, period right there. And I think so far attendance hasn't been an issue. The students that signed up for this bachelor program, they um, try to come to campus on these three to four days because that's their way to engage with their cohort, that's their way to engage with the teachers face to face. And I, um, I haven't seen an issue with that. Um, what sometimes becomes a little bit tricky is if classes are offered for more than just the group of the distance students uh, because it's across curriculums a course might be offered for different curriculums so you have the traditional on-campus students attending and being enrolled in the distance students and so it's been a little bit difficult to bring these groups together and um, to sort of navigate according to their to their needs. 